points of view. Um, as I said, this is very informal. Our panel don't have set speeches themselves. We literally want to encourage a discussion. Um, this is where we start encouraging the same wider discussions in the public as to how we address this problem. Um, unfortunately, our first speaker, Marianne McKay, who's a, a long-time Noongar activist. Is Green Left meant to be going to air? <laughs> Sorry about that. So we are actually zooming online, so the Eastern States as well. They're, they're, no, they're, they're unmuted now, thank you. Oh. Sorry about that. So yeah, people are participating okay. online in the Eastern States as well. Um, yeah, Marion McKay, who's a long time Noongar activist, was going to be one of our first speakers. Unfortunately, she's had a, a family um, uh, tragedy. Her sister is very, very ill, so she couldn't make it today. Um, we have Caleb Houseman, who is a um, social science member, but also a very active member with Extinction Rebellion. So he'll be talking about the place that uh, you know activist groups like Extinction Rebellion play. In the struggle. Um, Alison Zamon, um, who's a Greens member of the Legislative Council. Um, she's been involved as an activist in movements for protecting forests, nuclear disarmament, education, health, and human rights. And Dirk Kelly, who's also a member of Social Science. Um, as you say, each speaker will have about 10 minutes, um, and then what we'll do is we'll, I think, we'll let all three speakers go and then we'll take questions at the end, discussions at the end. So if you want to jot down any questions you may have to save for later, you're more than welcome to it. Okay. Thank you. Alright, um jump what do you want to talk about? Speak to the question. <laughs> Alright, which question would that be sort of? <laughs> so what uh, what part does Extinction Rebellion play in um, tackling this Right, okay, we're going straight into the presentation. Yeah. Cool. Yes, I yes, see. Yes. Okay, right, okay, <laughs> cool. All right, yeah, um, so, yeah, I guess um, thanks for the introduction. <coughs> thanks for uh, letting people know who I am. Um, yeah, so basically the presentation I'm going to be giving today is about Extinction Rebellion. Um, it's positives, um, the positive space it fills in the activist scene and in pushing forward to climate justice and also its negative its limitations where I think it needs to go and how it needs to change in order to actually be effective at creating any kind of positive change. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get into it. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so we're going to go through the positives first. Um, basically, Extinction Rebellion, what is it? Um, so it started in May 2018 um, by two people called Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook. Um, So the positives of XR, I'm um, just going to go through them. Um, so, decentralization. So, something that marks XR different from many sort of organizations in the activist sphere or leftist sphere is that there isn't actually a, officially at least, a sort of a central um, decision-making body. Um, how it works <coughs> is you kind of just take up um, the mantle of XR, the branding, and you call yourself XR and then you kind of just do what you want, as long as you technically have to follow the 10 principles, which we're not going to be able to touch on due to time constraints, but um, that's basically how it works. Um, and then we've got the situation with it mitigates for hierarchy. So something that XR sort of often has its roots in is uh, anarchism. It often some of its principles, decentralization and sort of opposition to hierarchy is linked a lot in the theory of anarchism. Um, and so, but it doesn't make the mistake of kind of just declaring no hierarchies. It actually is a bit more explicit in that. One of its principles is breaking down hierarchies of power for more equitable participation. So it actually makes it more of a process. It doesn't actually just go, that's it, no leaders, no bosses, cool. It, it actually recognizes that. Hierarchy isn't something you just say no to, it's actually something you have to work against and have to overcome. And have to actually build the, the systems and the organs or whatever you want to call them to actually ensure that's possible. And one of the ways XI does that is uh, through consensus. And often a big objection to consensus is that you can't actually run a large org, you can't actually run a society through consensus. Because if you have 100 people, you can't have 100% of society agree on an issue. That's not how people work. We're always going to disagree. Where it comes that is by 
um, sort of decentralizing uh, at how it's our works on a local level. So you have different groups operating different tasks, um, and each one of those small groups will be made up of, on average, we're like seven to five people who then sort of get a job done, whether that's you know media or planning an action or training people for logistical roles. That all takes place in small groups. And that enables consensus to happen, which is one of the processes for mitigating hierarchy. Cool. So can we go to the next slide, please? Um, another big positive of XR is that it's um, helping to normalize breaking the law. Um, it's before Extinction Rebellion, basically the groups that were saying, no, we need to not do what the state says, was radical leftist groups. And that's something that um, is a bit unapproachable um, for a lot of people, but XR kind of helps to bridge that barrier. Um, I'm gonna get, gonna get to how it bridges that barrier um, in a moment, but what it does is, um, what, what, it, what it's enabled, what it's made happen, is it's made normal people who have not been involved in activism before go, oh, okay, we actually need to do something. The states or the government or whatever you want to call it isn't actually protecting us, isn't doing its job. We need to uh, rebel. We need to break that law. And that's a huge first step if we're actually going to be challenging the system. We're not just going to jump from point A of everyone's fine to point B. Um, we're changing the very fundamental structure of society, whatever process that is, whether it's revolution or um, building a new state within the other state or whatever you want to, whatever is your thing. Um, it also is a big environmentalist tent. Um, so XR attracts a broad base of people interested um, in environmental issues. Um, so you've got like Western Australia Forest Alliance who protect trees in the southwest. You've got Frack Off who campaign against fracking. But there hasn't really been a solid sort of activist law that isn't a government party that is a broad environmentalist tent. And that is part of its appeal, where it's general, it's open, you can go into it, have your own specific niche, and that's more than happy to fill. And also, it fills the niche in suburbia, where in the southwest it was way far, up north it could be frack off, but there wasn't really anything which really filled um, populated areas or environmentalist orgs. There was nothing really that filled that space. And XR, I think, helps fill that space pretty successfully. Um, cool. Next slide, please. So I think the two biggest positives of XR is its lack of so socialist or communist baggage, um, because the lack of red flags is a green flag for most people, whether it's due to Cold War propaganda, the failure of the USSR, whatever sort of um, reason you want to say that's the case, most people don't like red flags. They don't like hammer and sickles, they don't like that kind of iconography, they don't like the word socialism all the time. That's kind of changing with younger people, but they don't vote. <laughs> so like, it doesn't really, like, and what, what does socialism actually mean to them is a whole different story. Um, so it actually helps make the way people engage and enter exile a lot easier, because you're not hit with this sort of barrier of, oh, it's a bunch of communists, oh, why are they always communists advocating for progressive policies that I like, uh, why? You can actually sort of circumvent that and just sort of don't worry about it. Um, I'm gonna. Some people may disagree. That's a um, positive, and may say, well, actually, you need to sort of have some kind of relationship with the radical left. You need to be more explicit about that. I'm gonna get to that later in the negatives of XR. So, and I want to kind of differentiate the difference between branding and um, policy. I'm gonna get to that a bit later. Um, and the last big positive of um, Extinction Rebellion is its process of civil disobedience. It's a really, really core aspect of XR that other sort of activist orgs have used in the past, um, from you know civil rights movements, the suff suffragettes, etc. Um, and XR has sort of incorporated, incorporated that as a key part of its praxis. And by breaking the law, in terms of what I think is the biggest positive for breaking the law or civil disobedience is it breaks the law, gets the media attention, that's free outreach. You've just reached thousands of people online, whether that's, you know, they're going to get involved or simply you're able to get your messaging out, that's a huge positive, which a bunch of other radical left orgs have really struggled with. 
um, in, in sort of making anyone aware of your existence. And that's something XR does a bit better. We're still, at least in WA, a lot of people don't know XR exists, but I think that there's definitely more of an awareness than something that Social Alliance would have. Maybe Salt beats us on university campuses, but that's probably like the only space that we're um, not known as well. Um, all right, next slide, please. So um, I just mentioned civil disobedience as being a positive of XR. Um, I just want to talk about what that is for XR. Um, so um, it's XR's sort of general tactic for enacting change, um, where people break the law getting arrested, and through this process of clogging up the courts, inconveniencing the police, um, you're basic, basically hoping to make the government as inconvenienced as possible from public pressure, and also from clogging up the courts. Um, and then you kind of hope that they give some level of concession. Um, and this tactic was adopted after looking at the successes of a lot of long-term campaigns throughout history. Um, the three that I'm going to be mostly engaging with are the suffragettes, the civil rights movement, and the labor movement. Um, but there are more, I think it was something like 300 different sort of, to varying degrees of sizes, that the original study that XR took as inspiration um, sourced. But um, we're going to get to this theory of change, how civil disobedience relates to its uh, theory of making change in a moment. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so um, more concretely in XR, civil, what civil disobedience means is it's, um, sort of, it's a process of movement building. You break the law, you get media attention, you get outreach, you get people involved, you break the law, you get a bigger action, you break the law some more, you get more and more people and you kind of just snowball. That's, that's the, the hope, the idea anyway. And eventually, you reach sort of this magical number that XR's kind of cited that its founders, at least Roger Hallam and some people who take this theory seriously, that 3.5% of the population is all you need to radically transform society. Um, there are issues where it's kind of taken out of context of what the original study was saying, and you can kind of just object to the whole principle that you can mathematically determine how much you need to change, how many people you need to transform society and just ignores all the other context surrounding that. Um, there's also an issue in XR that what civil disobedience ends up relating um, concretely varies a lot. So we're probably all aware of the five bridges that XR UK took in London that like reached international news, everyone saw it, it gave a lot of momentum for a lot of other um, XR groups across the globe. Here in WA, we probably reached, we had our biggest rally probably because of stuff like that. Um, it was very shortly before and that kind of propelled us to get a lot of media attention and get a lot of people showing up to the rally. Um, but there is also, because of this idea of we just need an inconvenience, oh, running out of time, all right, be quick. Um, because of this idea, you just need 3.5% of the population to make change, it's kind of devolved to the point in some places where you just get arrested, you just break the law. Um, one example of that is this poster. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Um, can we go back, please? Uh, where is it gone? There we go. That one. Wait, back. I don't know where it went. There we go. That poster, <laughs> sorry. Um, where people were literally exiled or some segment of XR UK was saying, put a red hand on a building, take a picture of it, go to the police station, say, hey, I graffitied something, arrest me. There was no like organized event, there was no massive media attention, it was literally just like inconvenience the police with paperwork and they'll do stuff for us. Like it was just, it, it, it's a really sort of low bar of what XR is. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, so we're gonna get into the negatives of XR. Oh, did I give the old slide? Oh dear, maybe, I don't know. Uh, let's go back, actually. So I think maybe the font, the, something's broken, but we'll, it works. All right, um, all right, so we're gonna talk about the negative of XR, and there are two main things I wanna engage with. The principle of being apolitical, it's one of the 10 principles that, it, we're going beyond politics, we don't care about ideology, it's not actually a thing, we're, we're all about facts and logic and we don't care about your feelings and just ridiculous just sort of this um very liberal ideology that you can just reject 
politics altogether. And then I also want to critique the theory of change, how civil disobedience in 3.5% of the population, and then the government will just do stuff for you. Because um, it demands climate action from the government through civil disobedience. It's not actually aiming to make the change itself. It's not actually aiming to make people make the change themselves or inspire people. It's just wanting the government to do it for us by inconveniencing. So next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to be quick on the attempt at being apolitical. Um, critique one number. The reason I think XR's attempt at being apolitical um, is bad for, is for a couple of reasons. One, it limited, limits the discussion of what a post-capitalist society can actually look like. You go, we're not, we're not, um, we're apolitical. We can actually talk about that, um, and it kind of creates this barrier where, well, actually, most of the anti-capitalist, post-capitalist, whatever you want to call them, societies throughout history have been. Um, very explicitly leftist. Um, it kind of limits the kind of um, policy, kind of what do we actually need to do to get past this system. Um, uh, it, it limits that discussion. Um, by not being explicit about what is causing the climate crisis, capitalism, uh, XR obfuscates, I only ever read that word, the scale of action required and defends the legit legitimacy of the state. So if you see in this picture here, XR UK made this banner where it says Metropol Metropolitan, Met Metropolitan Police and Extinction Rebellion both working for a safer London. Um, act, yeah, actually going like, oh yeah, we're buddies with the police. Which is like, let's. But we're yeah. apolitical though. Yeah, we're apolitical. <laughs> but like, come on, we're just, you know, you can be liberal and apolitical, it's fine. Um, and it sort of this, it, this attempt at being apolitical basically just shuts itself out from any kind of serious analysis of the system. It kind of goes, we're just going to accept the default ideology. That's what ends up meaning. Um, here's another one. Um, just to be clear, we're not a socialist movement. We do not trust any single ideology. We trust the people chosen by sortition, like jury service, to find the best future for all of us through a citizens' assembly. A banner saying socialism or extinction does not represent us. And then the late David Graeber replied, before he died, I don't know who writes these tweets, but they should be fired. This is either awful PR or intentionally trying to alienate someone. And basically he's pointing out like, okay, so you're, you're going to say you're not socialist, but also you're not going to point out that capitalism is the problem here. And it's, you kind of just going to wander around in this, I don't know, the blindfold on, or actually engaging with the problem. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to get into the meat of this presentation now. Um, so na big negative of XR is the theory of change, that you only need 3.5% of the population acting in civil disobedience to actually make change. The problem with this is twofold. Um, it understates the scale of action required to avert climate change, um, and it overstates the effectiveness of civil disobedience throughout history. Uh, next slide, please. So by understates the action by the scale of action required, I meaning that averting climate change is not comparable to the challenge of gaining oh sorry. Is not um, is not comparable to this challenge of gaining universal suffrage, decent labor rights, or ending legally enforced segregation. To avert climate change, we need to restructure nearly every single facet of our economy. Um, so I'm gonna go through next slide, please. What, what does actually averting climate change actually mean? Um, so we have the four main polluting sectors. So this doesn't even engage with the ecological crisis of um, all different species being wiped out and ecosystems is collapsing. This is just climate change. Um, so electricity and heat production, 25%. Uh, AFO, AFOLU is agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Industry, 21%. Transport, 14%. So if you just click through this, please. This should be an animation that works. No. Yeah. Um, so, electricity and heat production. We need to be transitioning to 100% renewable energy sources. Uh, next, just click through all of them, please. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. So, to replace um, AFLU includes industrial agriculture. That's um, highly pollutant. You've got pesticides, herbicides. You've got soil degradation. You've got desertification. You've got land clearing. You've got um, livestock, which actually makes 14.5% of our total emissions globally. Um, so that, that whole sector needs to be transformed. Um, the solutions I put here are just sort of what I think are the most likely or most effective. 
to agroforestry, urban food forests, more or less vegetarianism, veganism, and just rapidly um, reforesting um, what's well, fine right now. Apologies for that time. Um, industry degrowth, potentially 3D printing technology if it gets good enough. Spare parts can just be replaced off sort of some community's um, metal printer. Transport, we need just rapid rail everywhere, like road can't last, even electrical cars are too pollutant to create and maintain. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, so restructuring our economy, why civil disobedience isn't enough. The scale of action required for any one of these challenges is far more than any of the challenges faced by workers, the suffragettes, the civil rights movement, etc. This is not to say there are any less important, so I really want to make that key. All of those movements were really, really important. Um, like if we didn't, if we didn't have, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to live in a world where everyone didn't have the right to vote, where segregation was illegally enforced, or workers didn't have any kind of um, labour rights. Like I don't want to live in that world. I'm saying that the scale of action required to actually change society to avert climate change is just it is monumentally larger. Um, so applying the tactics which were successful in these movements makes the error, error in thinking that they are comparable in scale. Next slide, please. Um, overstates the effectiveness of civil disobedience. Okay, so previous slide, please. There we go, cool. Um, so averting climate change is not comparable to the challenges faced by past civil disobedience movements, but these movements were not successful in resolving their conflicts. Okay, so that's, that's the next point is it actually overstates the effectiveness of civil disobedience. It goes, civil disobedience worked for all these groups, so why wouldn't it work for us? I'm going to talk about why it didn't actually really solve fundamental problems. Next slide, please. All right, so late movement. Um, we all know where, how it happened, where it came from. Um, workers had terrible conditions, and they strike, and they use other tools. Um, and that's kind of the narrative that XR uses, is they strike, they were non-violent, capitalists went, oh, you, you inconvenience us. Inconvenience us. Please just keep working. Here's some better wages and have a weekend and etc. etc. Um, when it was actually a lot more messy like that than that. Um, skip, skip, skip. Um, so I'd like to the the big issue with saying that this labor movement is an example of civil disobedience working is that the fundamental um, problems that the workers back then faced are still sort of relevant now. We're seeing wages stagnate. We're seeing um, um, exploitation sort of going up. Uh, we're seeing a growing wealth gap. Um, we're the old form of colonials colonialism we saw back then has morphed into the new form of imperialism we see now. Um, so it's actually not, it kind of just sort of shrunk the problem enough where people stopped caring enough. But the fundamental sort of gears, the fundamental machine was still in existence and kept rolling. Um, and we don't have that opportunity with climate change where we can just shrink the problem, forget about it 100 years later, oh, it's still an issue. Oh, okay, whoops, we've just destroyed the planet. Um, so next slide, please. Um, suffragettes, another big example Exile likes to cite as an example of civil disobedience working. Um, there's actually a really big argument that it wasn't actually the suffragettes that um, the suffragettes that got themselves the vote it was actually the, the impacts that World War One had on a lot of Europe. Um, a bunch of people came back without the right to vote. They were really angry. The government was like, "Okay, you can you can vote now, all right?" Um, but I also I think the the more key critique that you can make is that they didn't actually solve the issues um, relating to the feminist movement. We have many waves of feminism since then. Um, the patriarchy still exists, we have a wage gap, um, rape culture is still alive and well, you know, it's shifted and morphed and perhaps shrunk to some degree, but we don't have a hundred years to like slowly work on this problem through civil disobedience. It doesn't, we don't have that time. Um, next slide, please. Civil rights movement, another example. Um, so just really clear and simple. The end of legally enforced segregation didn't end segregation. It still exists de facto. It exists here in Australia, it exists here in the US, it exists all around the world. Um, there's, I think it's um, Flint still has issues with its water system because they're a black majority community and the government doesn't care about them. Like the civil disobedience didn't fix these issues for them. It just ticked a box on some government policy that went, you're equal now, and didn't actually fix the problem. The same will be with climate change. Um, all right, next slide, please. 
So, averting climate change requires radically restructuring the economy. Civil disobedience has never done more than force mild concessions, therefore XR's theory of change is not an effective strategy in averting climate change. Um, so, next slide please. So what does that mean for XR? If XR's theory of change is ineffective at averting climate change, what does that mean for XR? I see three possible futures. The first is XR's disintegration due to inability to make change. The second is XR doubles down on the theory of change. And the third is XR realizes that it needs to do more, demand change, and instead become a force helping to build the change required. So next slide, please. So I'll be real quick on this one. XR doesn't do anything, doesn't actually make effective change. People realize this isn't working and kind of just, it, the whole structure collapses. Um, people may argue this is a good thing, but I think it's much better to, XR's in a place where you only need a few small tweaks to become effective and rebuilding some other structure that won't have the brand recognizability and may end up repeating the same mistakes is not a good idea. We, we I think that XR's disintegration would be a bad thing. Next slide, please. Then we have the doubling down of theory of change. What I mean by that is XR sees themselves as, okay, we're not being hardcore enough about civil disobedience. We actually need to break the law more. Um, and this can sort of um, be expressed in advocating for everyone getting arrested at a protest, getting arrested the moment you get let out of the court, etc. Um, Roger Hallam, one of the co-founders of XR, since has been kicked out of XR, started on a new org called Burning Pink. Um, he got kicked out because of Burning Pink, um, where he said, the moment you get let out of court, you need to get arrested again. You need to just, come, just go through this cycle of going into prison, out, breaking the law, getting back in. Um, this, in my opinion, would be the worst path forward for XR. And something I see as a potential trend for XRWA. And if that's the case, I also expect it to be a trend for over East, um, in Europe as well, and in the UK, and the rest of Europe potentially. So next slide, please. So here's a quote from Roger Hallam. Being in revolt means going to government buildings, breaking their windows, throwing paint at them, getting arrested, getting let out, going to do it again, blah, blah, blah. You get let out, you do it again. And basically what this is, is it's the action where you painted a red hand on a building, get yourself arrested, but then turned up to 10 or 11 or whatever expression. Um, basically just, you go through that revolving door, you break the law as much as you can. You don't have a mass action where you're going to get media attention and get more people involved. You're simply trying to just inconvenience the courts and inconvenience the government and that'll make change. Um, the problem with this is it's not actually going to make a difference. The government is more than capable of going all right, fine, you're on the prison, free labor. Um, all right, we're gonna increase the police state that's been increasing since 9 11. We're just gonna arrest you before you even attempt an action. Like it, the idea that the government would capitulate to this rather than just, and, and, um, and go against all of the capitalist interests, which it has def routinely defended for hundreds of years, is ridiculous. It would not do that, ever. Um, so, next slide, please. Sorry. Time. Apologies, everyone. I've got two slides left. So this is um, of XR. All right, so this is where I think XR needs to go for it to actually be an effective org um, to actually be useful um, for averting climate change, or at least combating climate change. Um, XR's focus on local groups puts it in a prime position to become a political force in all communities, divorced from the existing political structure that is sort of demonstrated itself incapable of actually doing what needs to be done. Um, when crisis propels people to find an alternative, because at this point, climate change is happening, we're on that path, we're potentially seeing two degrees Celsius on average change, or a rise in temperatures. Um, so we've actually got to try and find a way to engage people when that happens, to go, okay, we actually have the solution, get involved, let's, let's survive this thing, let's try and build a new world. Um, because otherwise, the government or some other um, up and coming group, whether it's reactionary or not, will take that spot. And if its potential for being reactionary is quite scary. Um, so we have to demonstrate the alternatives in our communities. By doing this, we'll provide a piece of a beautiful future, fully realized tactical, tactile, and ready to replace its destructive economy. Last slide. <laughs> All right. Oh. Uh, what should um, socialists be doing? Right, so socialists should be coming, and I would advocate that socialists, as people who are aware of 
how bunk this theory of changes need to get involved in local groups um, and actually try and um, argue that line um, in, a, in a friendly way that doesn't get you kicked out, doesn't piss everyone off in XR going, okay, so I'm just trying to call XR. Do it in a friendly way, please. Um, <laughs> Um, I think socialists should be investigating and implementing whatever post-capitalist technologies they can in their communities because even if we seize the state tomorrow and um, we centralise planning, blah, 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 we're still going to have to radically transform the economy. We're still going to have to replace industrial agriculture, industry, we have to re energy system. We might as well start doing that now. And the positive is that we can actually start implementing some of it. So permaculture, urban food forests, we can do that today, slowly, obviously not do it today. Um, community funded renewable energy projects, that's something you can do. Um, and whatever else we actually think is going to help communities become independent from the system and actually build resilience against um, climate change. Um, that's me done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's obviously going to be some meaty and controversial discussion after that this week, so just keep in your mind any points you um, wanted to jump up and down about. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Speaking in. And Elson. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are leaving on the lives of all of our people to pay my respects to elders, um, past, present, and emerging if this is stolen land. And what, there is much that we need to do um, to achieve justice for our First Nations people. Um, I don't have a presentation, and I'm not here to talk about, to reflect on the Greens. Um, as we're going into the future, I wanted to speak to the question that had been posed um, for us today, which was about how do we, what, how do we uh, work towards achieving ecological justice in the face of um, pretty much it feels insurmountable forces uh, in this state, um, but particularly um, as we are, as it's been rightly identified in many ways, we are a bit of a gas heartland, and this is an issue which I'm obviously grappling with uh, every day in my job. Um, as a Greens uh, Member of Parliament is pretty much core to um, what is occupying a lot of um, our distress and, and our concerns. I, will, I think I will um, touch on something particularly that, that rises this. I've been, um, I'm 51 years old, I've been an activist since I was 14 years old and, um, and has, as, has been, as has been mentioned, like I'm a Member of Parliament now but throughout all that time I have remained an activist and a, and a campaigner. Uh, and that has been through the whole suite of, of activities and, and numerous issues. Um, whether it's me trying to get arrested down at um, forests, um, or actually, I've, I've actually tried to get arrested twice. Once was at in the forest, and the second time, I'm not going to shout, by the way. I'm a, I'm a small woman, and I apologise <laughs> for the fact that I don't have a big voice box. Um, and so, and the second time was actually on a, a part of a union blockade. Um, both times um, I failed to get arrested because the police just came up and went yoink and just pointed and just pulled me to the side, which at the time I remember feeling a little bit humiliated about, but I'm actually really glad now because um, it's easier to get into Parliament if you don't have a criminal record. <laughs> and as a lawyer now, it's easier, it's easier to also be admitted to practice if you don't have a criminal record. So that ended up being quite fortuitous. But um, I think it's important to also, I'd also like to point out that I've, I spent 10 years as, as a union official and, um, and one of the things that I've certainly been uh, taken very seriously has been how do you form those alliances across the community. So I work quite actively with the churches, um, the progressive churches obviously not the fundamentalist rat bags that drive people to Suicide. Um, so the progressive, uh, the progressive churches are work clearly, I would still work with the unions, why wouldn't I? Um, I am of the union, um, and also working with grassroots groups. And I do want to say that uh, we, I could not do the sort, of, the sort of advocacy that I do in the Parliament without, without groups that are prepared to get arrested, without groups that are prepared to push the envelope. Um, the reality is that this issue of how do you, how do you achieve change is not a is not a new issue, it's one that many of us have been grappling with for decades and will continue to. Um, but, and, and the simple answer is that I believe there is no one solution that you actually, that you, you take, it's going to take all forms of activism, all forms of activity. So one of the decisions that I made um, a long time ago, um, I joined the Greens as a founding member and as a pretty, as a pretty um, active uh, environmental activist back, uh, back I joined 30 years ago, 
And one of the things that inspired me at that point was um, Senator um, Joe Valentine, who was in, in Parliament and constantly getting arrested and um, in with nonviolent direct in terms of nonviolent direct action and, and seeing how much that influenced people and affected people. And I think the other thing to know about Joe Valentine is that she's driven by faith. She's driven because she, as, as a Quaker, she thought that it was really important to, to bear witness to what was happening. And so if you want to talk about a continuum of approach, that, that was something that I was, that I was very much inspired by. Um, I've remained active in the party around my activism since then, and that's because I am strongly of the view that um, parliamentary democracy, uh, faith or flawed as it is, and it is, is nevertheless a site that we should not cede over to um, the interests of capital. I, I, I firmly believe that. I, um, I firmly believe that as long as we have parliamentary democracy, that we should be trying to affect it we should be trying to change it and we should be using that as one of the many tools um, for change. And, uh, and that is what I particularly want to concentrate on today. Um, I will say from the outset, anyone who looks to politicians to be leaders as change agents, you're deluded, don't. Because politicians are there to effectively go where the community um, tells them to go. That's the first thing that you, that you really need to, to know. So um, at the end of the day, it's about changing the way that communities, hearts and minds, and, it's, and then that will impact uh, on, and putting pressure to bear on politicians. So the politicians have no choice other than to listen. So in relation to the question that has been asked, um, it's pretty easy for me to answer around what, what I see the key challenges are under, are under a McGowan government and why we find ourselves in the situation we are now. Um, it's because the McGowan government is completely and totally beholden to the gas industry. You just need to look at the uh, electoral donations reforms to know that this is the case. Okay? So the amount of money, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the gas industry is donating directly to the Labor Party um, should chill you. That end, be very clear, gas industry does not donate money because they feel warm and fuzzy. They do it because they expect a return on their dollar. And under the McGowan government, my goodness, are they getting a return? So the first thing I would say is we need to change dramatically our donation laws and our electoral laws. They are, at the moment, in my opinion, criminal. I think that they are a very, very um, severe danger to any form of democracy. And it's something that the Greens have actually called for a complete ban from corporate donations. We go so far as to say that um, election, we believe that elections should be publicly funded. That's in our, that's in our policy. But, at, but we also recognise, this is what, what you alluded to, that sometimes people won't allow us to do what we need to do overnight. So what we do is, is that, at the very least, can we please ban all corporate donations? And if we can't do that, can we at least ban it from certain industries and the fossil fuel industries is one of them. So we already talk about, in other states, we, we ban donations from developers. That's happened in New South Wales, had to, as a result of numerous <laughs> scandals. Um, it, and we talk about donate, um, not having tobacco and gambling interests. That's another one we should anyway. <laughs> um, go there. But, um, so but they, they, they donate plenty of money to the OLP as well, and aren't they getting a good bucket? You know, aren't they getting a good return on their investment? But um, one of the things we need to do is we really need to clean up uh, the way who, who gets to fund our political parties and how what our decision makers then can, can do with that. Um, related to that is transparency. Um, I'm able to tell you that because we, my office does a lot of work as part of the Democracy for Sale project, um, to, which is something the Greens have been doing Australia-wide for quite some time, to, and to actually tell you this is where your dollars are. But that takes a lot of investigation by my staff and by volunteers and people around the country, um, by chasing the dollars and finding where the dollars are. And even then, there's still a lot of what we term grey money, um, that is money that is donated by third parties, um, money that falls between the cracks, cracks around disclosures between federal and state regimes, those sorts of things. So we need to know who is paying our politicians, how is that actually, how is that um, actually happening, what's happening in practice. But I suppose the other thing that I want to pose, 
um, that is a particular challenge, and it's related to this issue of donations, I think, is the media landscape. Um, you cannot separate out um, the fact that uh, Stokes, as the owner of the West Australian, Seven News Media, and now the Sunday Times, how they do that ever happen, and uh, is also donating directly to the ALP, and has also got gas interests, which are now being rubber stamped going through. And the combination has been um, devastating for democracy and devastating for trying to address climate change. So we're seeing um, the expansion of browse occur under this government uh, with uh, impunity. And we're seeing that they are locking in a climate future which is, well, it's going to kill the planet. Um, even if you cared about what happens to the interests of capital, which I don't, you're going to have a bunch of stranded assets. It's the best case scenario for those. So anyone who look at it, it's actually um, deeply irresponsible. Uh, but more than anything, it's going to kill our future for our kids. So these are the things that we grapple with. We're going into an election where we are we are, have a main daily newspaper that is a shameless and despicable cheerleader for um, the Gower government and has utterly, utterly abandoned any pretense of being the fourth estate. Um, and we have a, a gutted ABC uh, with staffing that just, they just can't keep on top of all the things that, that need to happen. Um, we, and, over, and over here, we just, it's just next to impossible to be able to cut through. That's before I even start talking about the challenges and other fake news and all of the things that we know are, are very heavily canvassed in relation to the way that social media has been able to be used and abused. Um, I'm curious to have more of a conversation with you about your thoughts on this. One of the things that has been really useful for me, being a member of parliament, which has given me an opportunity which I didn't have so much when I was working in the union movement and when I did various activist groups, is that I get to speak to a really broad range of people. And that is a often a real eye-opener for me because it means that I don't have the luxury of being in a bubble. Um, if I look at my Facebook feed, I'm in a bubble, but that's because I I'm only friends with people I like. There's actually quite a few people in this room that I'm friends with, friends with, um, and, because, and so I get, and so that's, and that's important for my well-being, frankly, because I have to be reminded that I'm not going mad, um, and that there are actually really decent, good, gorgeous human beings in the world. But it does mean that I am exposed to how a really broad range of, of, of views, and it's not just the people who feel the need to send me death and rape threats often in different fonts and a strange variety of outright capital letters and small. Um, but also talking to just regular people who have their own interests but are not necessarily particularly engaged with the community. We do that through door knocking, we do that through uh, and just through the things that I do in the nature of my job. So that has helped to really influence my thinking about how do you affect change, how do you bring people along. Because we do need people that are pushing the envelope, it's absolutely critical. But we also need to find ways to be able to engage with people who otherwise do care, and they care about the kids, and do care about the children. But what, what, are the, what are the mechanisms by which you actually um, don't have them turned off, or what it is that they're doing as well. And um, I know that that sounds like, oh, well, you're just going to sell out there. Uh, that's just lazy thinking, sorry. But I'm actually talking about trying to achieve change. And we need people to we need people to come along this journey. And here's the good news. You don't need everyone to come along. I don't have to get it. I don't have to convince a Nazi to change their view. I get to dismiss them. Um, but, and I will dismiss them because they're a Nazi. But, um, and I'll punch them too if I get the <laughs> I'm quite happy to be punching Nazis. And that's on the record. <laughs> better than shooting them, which is what my grandfather used to do. Um, so I think that um, it's really important that we we talk about how do we engage with, broad, with a, a, a broad range of people around this as well. And that's not everybody's job, but maybe that's part of my job. So I'll just leave it there if that's okay. And, yeah, but
if we continue to create technology through the exploitation of the global south, through the exploitation of our minerals and our resources, to create new technologies that again are owned <coughs> by a few, that are worked on by the many with minimal uh, wages, then we'll just result in a society that is still headed towards an ecological crisis, but is doing it with a bit of garnishing on top in this society where we'll see our solar panels and we'll see our wind turbines and we'll think, hey, we're doing it, we're saving the earth. Well, we're not, we're still extracting, we're still shipping those big towers across the earth on uh, fossil fuel driven machinery. That's why we stand here. We stand here to say that if we are gonna have a transition to a just society, then we need to transition the control of the means of production. I want to use those terms because as you know, a socialist, these are things that we talk about. We want the workers to be able to have a say over what it is that's being developed. We want the workers and the people in the community to know where it is their energy is coming from, to know that there are many options for how we generate energy and many other considerations. So one of the key aspects of capitalism is this belief that, well, is this necessity to grow profit. Year after year, the capitalist system demands that more profit is extracted, that shareholders receive more of a return on their value, on their investment. That profit is retrieved through the exploitation of externalities. And those externalities might be the wages of the people that work for them, but it also is definitely our environment, our landscape, the resources that we have on this earth. So, without saying, well, I'm just gonna, we need to replace our energy production. We also need to change how much energy we consume. Having a system that relies on the vast amount of energy that it does to produce more energy, to produce more profits, isn't a sustainable way forward. So again, we need to be here as socialists pushing on the policies that change the goals of society so that the, we can focus on the quality of life for people, the, the things that actually matter to people and not the profits for the shareholders. So, yeah, I don't want to go over too much of what else everyone else says. I think it's really good for us to get into the audience, but that's why I'm here is to, you know, the Greens have very good policies and absolutely are a force for change in the society that we ally with. However, Socialist Alliance wants to see more alliance around anti-capitalist perspectives. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Thank you all three panelists. Um, I think it pretty much captures the uh, all the different elements, the, the very need to work together, alliances, friendships, um, to, to battle this two way uh, roundabout that that we've been stuck in since day dot, basically. Um, so what I'll do, I'll take three questions at a time. Hopefully we'll have a bit of a chat and then yeah. Yeah. Barry? Um, look, uh, just just on the train coming here actually, I, I was um, reading a book um, uh, by Marion Wilkinson, who's a top line Australian journalist. It's called The Carbon Club. And it's her account of how the um, climate sceptics, the, the phony scientists in the pay of the fossil fuel companies, came to dominate the um, political discourse in Australia. Um, I got it in order to review it for the Green Left Weekly, and I can't go on reading it. I can't bear it. I'm, I need to find somebody else who's going to review this book. Um, it's just too bloody upsetting. And... <laughs> um, and that brings me to what I want to say, because uh, a, a little over 100 years ago, uh, before World War I, the whole world knew that a cataclysmic war was going to come. Everybody knew it was going to come. It was breathing down everybody's neck. Um, just as now people know that climate change is going to be cataclysmic. Um, but before World War I, people couldn't bring themselves to take the socialist option. Uh, and World War I began, and, but it was during that process of that war, the, the, the French army mutinied in 1916 and refused to fight. Um, in Ireland in Easter 1916, there was the Easter uprising. Um, and finally, there was the Russian Revolution, and then the German troops refused to fight. 
Um, I hate to think that it's going to take a cataclysm before people will move to do what they know needs to be done. Because I think most people really know that capitalism does not have a future, but they cannot see an alternative future. They can't see an alternative future that's clear enough for them to commit to the kind of struggle that they know is going to be necessary. Um, I hope that the anti-capitalist struggle in Australia will be peaceful. Um, I know that our beloved rulers are not peaceful people, um, and so I fear for the worst. Um, but this question that Alison raised about how do we change society, well, I think a couple of things that we need to do are we, we need to bring people's we, uh, we need to um, help people to see that, yes, their fears are justified. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've been to, uh, this yeah, is for people, that, maps, okay, people who are over east. Um, <laughs> I've been talking about the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the ways in which to persuade people to take uh, action to change society. Um, we have to help people to see that, yes, their fears are justified about climate change. And we also help, have to help people to see that it's not terrifying to join in a mass rally like the high school students' climate strike last year, which was so magnificent here at Perth. I think those are, those are the steps that we need to take people through um, time and time again to draw into mass action <coughs> and to raise their spirits or raise their courage for the, the deep-seated changes that we really need. Second, you can just talk. Yeah. So if I if I can just respond to that, because Barry, mm. you, you pick up you pick up on a sentiment that I think is really really critical to this mm. whole discussion, and that is the issue of um, despair versus hope, mm. and it's a really it's a really critical one that we somehow have to get right. It's for someone like me, it's so frustrating. Um, because I've been talking about this thing called global warming since I've been talking about it since 1988. That's when I first read about it, became aware about it, and talked about it, and people. And at that point, people, the science was in, but there were, but there were still the people were still obviously going, well, you know, who knows? Da, 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 da. Fast forward, you know, on to 2007, um, I was running Scott Ludlam's um, first election campaign, and. And that was apparently going to be the climate change election. And, we, and I remember at the Greens, we were just going, yay, finally someone's talking about this is going to be the defining thing. Mm. Well, we all know how that turned out, don't we? And here we are, 2020. When I talk to people about, cl about climate change now, people accept the science and they go, but it's too late. Mm. There's nothing we can do. And I just I go, oh my God, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, so where was this magical, this magical point where we could have done something? So, and so um, even people like um, my husband, who you know, actually, he's a, um, people like my husband, he, he, he saw this footage, again, another one of the footage of a starving polar bear and about mm. to die, and he just, he said to me, you know, I've, I've, I've committed my life to this. He goes, even I can't look at this anymore. He goes, I can't, I just can't look at it. Mm. And, um, and so, and I just said, this is the thing. Like, if those of us who are at the forefront of this, mm. who have, who know the science, who know what we have to do, who say this is what we this is our this is what we have to do. If we're feeling like this, how is everybody else actually feeling? Mm. So I think that it's it's actually um, a genuine struggle for us about how do we, how do we turn um, the fact this the fact that it's mainstream recognised now um, and it is that serious and make sure that people continue to realise it's that serious and we have moments like the bushfires, mm. you know, and the end with stuff where people go, actually, this is just terrible and people are allowed to start talking about climate change, whereas five years ago when Adam Ben actually made the correlation between the bushfires and climate change, he got absolutely smashed by the Murdoch media. I'm um, told he was just, you know, this was not the time, because apparently there's never the time. <laughs> um, so how do we then turn that into, how do we turn that into a sense of hope? Um, I think that I think at this point, what it is, it's it's about proactively putting out there 
what the alternative future looks like. You, you're fra you frame it in terms in terms of um, challenging capitalism, mm. and the Greens would frame it in terms of challenging um, excessive consumerism. And you know, like I'm just mm. talking to you about the way that we would frame that, you know, because it would be different. So we would talk about excessive consumerism. We would talk about just the how how that's just killing the planet and it's killing pe and it's killing people, which it is. Um, and to also try to put up um, a vision of hope for what that for what that looks like. What does what does sustainable cities look like? What is what is a hundred percent renewable energy look like? And get people thinking about that and feeling positive about that. And going, this is actually good. We can do this transition. So, I think, and it can you can by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we can totally decarbonise, absolute hundred um, percent. But how but how do you how do you do that? And how the thing for us is how do you convince people? It's worth the initial investment because that's what it is, and that it's worth actually pissing off, call, you know, the large corporations that want to continue on a business as usual. But in actual fact, they're ramping up because they're trying to make sure they get as much out of their buck as they as they can before they completely lose their social license. How do you do that? So I suppose that's the thing I want to say. I'm sorry you couldn't read the book anymore. I actually understand that. I can't watch David Attenborough. No, because I love I love him. I love what he's yeah. doing. But for me, I have to I have to feel capable. And the, the despair is is a killer. And despair will stop us from achieving anything. Caleb, did you want to respond to that? So how do you? I mean, XR obviously agree yeah. that know that time is nigh. That's why mm -hmm. they're acting. So how do XR stimulate hope while? having to make people aware of, like, you know, time is past. Um, well, I, I can talk on what XR's sort of branding perspective is, or I can talk what my perspective is. I guess um, XR's perspective is, I guess, I guess in terms of actual people within XR, there is a growing sentiment that, okay, maybe this isn't working. Maybe we're not quite on the right track. The issue is then the one I tried to talk about, is where do people actually, which direction are they going to head um, after that? Um, I think that's a uh, potential for concern for losing the momentum in some kind of sort of just vacuum of just sort of um, civil disobedience. Um, but in in my opinion, I think it's really important to ask ourselves: okay, what what examples in history are there where society has been radically transformed without there being a crisis active on people actually completely screwing them over? I don't think there are any. I think the only time society has been radically transformed is when crisis is on everyone. Like Russian Revolution, Zapatistas, China, Rojava, it's all when people are like, we're absolutely screwed, what the hell is going on? And I think it's the same thing with climate change. I think the only time people are actually going to engage and actually react to what's happening, like actually react to climate change and, and make a change, is when it's it's screwing us, not not just in sort of during the summer when there are fires, but constantly and actually disrupting us. <laughs> I think that's the only time it's going to happen. So I think we kind of got to accept climate change is locked in. Um, it's 1.5 degrees at least, um, and we've got to think about okay, what does that actually mean? What does that? How do we prepare for that? That would be my sort of perspective. Katrina, can I? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'll touch on a few things that my fellow panelists talked about. So yeah, as, as socialists, we would specify that uh, the issue is our mode of production, it is capitalism, the way that it operates. Um, and I think to put that onto consumerism, my critique of that would be the consumerism points the problem back to the individual. Um, we know that 71% of emissions are produced by 100 companies. Uh, we know that the way that we move energy and the way that we utilize and waste energy is massive. We have gas tankers that drive, that sail or whatever, that move over to Singapore during that time, lose half of their gas because it dissipates out, sit outside of ports, trying to sell that on a market, and then lose it. That's not the result of anyone's consumerist behavior. On top of that, consumerism is driven by a society that demands consumption. So capitalism requires that the citizens engage in civic action by purchasing, by consuming. I think where we come in with a socialist perspective and when we talk about, I'm not a huge fan of hope, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I, um, I tend to think that hope puts the person in the position of expecting change but not really knowing how to get there or be a part of that. 
As socialists, one of the core tenets, and this isn't really well understood in the general lexicon, but we're trying to help people understand that they are the agents of change, that all of us in here are far more powerful if we're united than a few who own all the wealth and resources. However, if we're not united, if we're not on the same page, then we are powerless. Capital controls the decisions that happen in our society. So how do we introduce that hope into people's lives? I think it's by giving them purpose, by giving them actions, by showing them that we can be reconstructing the way that we do our businesses by having more, as a transitionary idea, worker cooperatives, where more of the workers have, get to have a say about what happens there. As Alison pointed out, we need funding in order to do this. Okay, but instead of funding BP's shell, you know, shell company, instead of funding <laughs> some fossil fuels shell company of green technology that ultimately they're just going to profit off of and make all the decisions about, we should be funding green movements that are run by the people, that are local or you know state or national enterprises that use the workers to make the decisions about what needs to happen, that uses the perspective of parents who care about their children to democratically make decisions about how those resources are spent to challenge the fossil fuel industry. So my, my core point here is XR gets people to be engaged with what I see as what, what hits a local maxima because you're not allowed to engage in politics, you're not allowed to you know, criticise corporations or any of that. So they've got the right idea of engaging the people, but I don't think they put them into a productive action. And we will lose out if our goal is to try to convince people that politicians, as Alison said, will make the right choices, yeah, will do the right thing. Because they won't. They'll <laughs> respond. They yeah. <laughs> They'll respond to society. And so it's not with it. It is only with the joining of the people across whatever parties that we have or whatever groups we have to actually understand that working together and owning our decisions is going to be an effective way to make that change. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, Pedro, Mace and Graham in the next block of three. Have we got anyone online that's indicated? Um, I, I received one question a while back. Um, just, I think it was directed for Jake, uh, Caleb real quick. It was, how does XR support the people getting arrested and fined? Is there, a pol is there a policy that no one has to cover their own court costs? Otherwise, the burden might be shared. <laughs> this is, okay, yeah, this is, a big, <laughs> this is a big point of conflict within XR. Um, I can only speak for how WA works. I'm not sure how Over East works, but in WA, the people um, that were, um, we, we had a team of people like pro bono lawyers and we quizzed basically like, what, what's the best way to approach this and they informed us that don't have an official XR donation page because what that'll mean is the judges will catch on to that and give higher fines you're better off t telling everyone that's got arrested to make their own GoFundMe pages and then XR can share them um, it, there's, there's a lot of like, like maybe that's technically sound um, like, but the issue is that XR, at least in WA, has then taken the stance of kind of like, we'll leave it up to everyone else to be independent about it. And it's kind of this conflict of simultaneously advocating, we get everyone arrested, we all be acting civil disobedience, and also it's your, it's your problem, go deal with it. Like, it's, uh, you're independent. Um, and it's, it's another, it, you know, I could only talk about so much in the <laughs> time I squeezed over. Um, this is another thing I think is a problem in XR that needs to shift away from this theory of change. Um, yeah, I think that's another terrible element. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, if you don't mind, Pedro, should we have to sure. take Mace next? Because you can also speak to... Mace is also a member of Extension Rebellion. I don't want to speak to that. No, oh, okay. I think Caleb... You had, your, Caleb. All right. you had your hand up anyway. Yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to pull a couple of threads that I see connecting between what Alison said about building practical frameworks and what Dirk said about giving people you know, sort of like meaningful, engaging, practical ways of doing things. Um, and how those two things sort of relate to XR's framework of building local community groups and where the potential within movements like XR could potentially resolve 
those two threads. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know if that was super clear. <laughs> I get really shaky with the microphone. No, it's fine, thank you. So my, my question was largely directed at Caleb, but I just wanted to open up a discussion about how those two things could potentially work within the framework of XR. So okay. like where the intersection of XR and social alliance could be, or...? Um, more about how XR or what role XR could play, movements like XR could play, in giving people that, that practical, meaningful call to action in the time of hope versus despair. Mm. Pedro? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, two things. One, very briefly, uh, coming back to the thing about hope, uh, I, I sympathize with, with Dirk's uh, comment there not being a big fan of, of hope. But uh, mm -hmm. just a, a little book recommendation, Terry Eagleton, uh, Eagleton's um, Hope Without Optimism is yes. a really good uh, tool in differentiating uh, hope from optimism. Uh, optimism as something, uh, as the irrational expectation that uh, the best outcome will happen and hope as uh, a more rational approach to the possibility that something good may happen if, if you work towards it. And the other thing regarding Extinction Rebellion in particular, uh, I'm no expert, I, I, yeah, I only uh, learned something about uh, their action, uh, which is admirable uh, in, in, in some regard. Uh, but my question is um, how or if there is any discussion uh, within in regards to um, the scope that it has in term terms of, well, if a middle class British person gets arrested, okay, they can cope with it and go into that. Uh, if a white Australian gets arrested, okay, they may get fined and may have trouble paying for that. But if a non-white person gets arrested, well, they may, may end up uh, with a death in custody or uh, an, an immigrant can get kicked out because of they failed the character test and, uh, and uh, therefore the visa is, is revoked. Or people in, in, in non-first world countries uh, you know, may, may suffer from torture, from, from uh, other um, much heavier consequences than just, you know, these are turning up, I, please arrest me, I, I did a graffiti. So if, if that kind of discussions happen uh, within and what kind of uh, uh, view there is beyond the first world kind of uh, action that uh, mm -hmm. I've seen. Okay, thank you. I'll just take one more question. Because we want to respond to all Yeah, give a chance. Like, Graham? Beware, guys. If you can try and limit your questions to... Yeah, okay. I just wanted to ask... Um, the, the Extinction Rebellion speaker, Caleb, and also the social, well, the social well, all three really, but, um, about, uh, I had a look through the shelves, I see if the book was there, but it's not, the title is Out Now, it's a the subtitle is A Participant's Account of the Movement Against the Vietnam War, that is the American Movement Against the Vietnam War. Uh, that campaign was not mentioned in Caleb's list of major movements which I think should be, because it's one of the most important and successful movements of all time, right? certainly the 20th century. It succeeded, uh, and the movement here in Australia succeeded too, because uh, Australian troops were withdrawn from, uh, as a result of mass action, basically. It wasn't civil disobedience. There was a certain amount of people like me who threw things through the windows of Remington Rand and stuff like that. That's a form of civil disobedience. But the main thing that stopped the war was um, Mass action, mass street action. But, I mean, mass, I mean, it was a mass movement and it had a huge impact in society as well. Radicalisation associated with that and the civil rights movement before it did significantly alter politics and society, uh, not just in the USA but in the whole the world. And as I say, it did succeed because the Vietnamese won their independence. That was the central demand they, they were fighting for and they won. And that we can learn from that, I think. But uh, I know that things might seem desperate that in, in terms of climate change, whether we've got the time and, and the scope to actually resolve the situation. But it's not desperate. I mean, uh, Greta Thunberg says, you know, we have, you know, she doesn't just want hope. Well, it's good to have hope, but she wants action. I mean, the, the movement wants action, and that's what we need. But it's action which has to involve 
mass participation. She, I mean, I, I was watching one of her videos, she's giving a talk somewhere, and she got off the platform and, and she, the, the last remark was, see you in the streets. That's what she said. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Panel? Yeah, I'm happy to. So there's a few things that were, that were um, talked about as well. So thank you for raising the privilege of arrest because that's something that I don't think people do talk about enough. And even here within, you know, um, Perth, I, I, was, I was actually assisting um, XR um, around some, a series of arrests where there, um, probably you know the guy I'm talking about, where we, there was an Aboriginal man, man who was singled out and mm -hmm. treated accordingly. And I ended up raising that in Parliament and having to and following that up with the Commissioner for Police. Um, because even here, that's exactly what happens, and it is dangerous to be an Aboriginal person who is arrested for um, anything. Um, so we see here that, uh, that that happens all the time, and um, and like I say, and if you get arrested, you you can get lawyers and you can do all the things. So I think I think it's really important that that's recognised as a tactic, and that people who are engaging in that. And I put myself, I've said, I put myself in that category as someone who's sought to be arrested in the past um, to actually say, what a privilege to be able to do that. Having said that, yay, to, particularly to the grandparents um, of the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who continually do that, um, because that also is about uh, fighting, that's also about challenging stereotypes about who exactly cares about this stuff and gets arrested, and I, it's, it's, it's really quite important. Um, I do want to pick up on this issue of hope. I want it to be very clear. Um, I am uh, I am someone who has hope, but without optimism. I don't have any optimism <laughs> at all. But I do have hope with possibility. And if I did not have hope, then I would. Why would you bother? If so, hope, because if, if 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 what is going if if what we're looking at is inevitable. And there's nothing that you can do. If you can't have any hope for possibility, well, you know what? I'm just going to go and focus on my family and focus on, you know, taking holidays and focus on, you know, why not? Because if the world is coming to an end and if that is the end of it and there is no possibility, if there is no hope at all, if that, if we knew that a meteor was coming in was, and it was like melancholia and the world was about to end, would you be going out trying to call for a revolution? No, you'd probably just be saying goodbye to your loved ones are doing that because there's no hope. Mm. So, um, People here might have this view that like, let's dismiss hope. I won't. I'm going to live with hope. I'm going to live with hope with possibility, although I do not have optimism. But I will, will live with hope and possibility because it's the only thing that can keep me going. It's the only thing that will make me withstand the death threats. It's the only thing that will make me continue to put my hand to, to put myself out because otherwise the alternative is... So, so that's that's something that I really do want to say, and I don't see it's about hope versus action. Action arises out of people believing that the future can be that can be different, and believing that a future can be better. And can I say that's what social science is about? So, social science is all about saying we actually think we can do it better. We actually think we can we can build a, a better future. Exiles are getting themselves arrested because they're going. We think we can do this better. We think we can we think we can build a better future. So um, when I was talking about hope before. I was responding to specifically to this issue of how do you allow people to know the seriousness of what it is we have to do, but not to the point where all hope is lost. So, and, and because I don't believe hope is lost. So I, I think I want to say that, but I do want to pick up on also finally on the point you made. I don't think that XR has to work with everybody else. I think there is strength in having change being achieved from everywhere from right across the board. I'm glad that the Greens are in Parliament. I'm glad that social science keep, uh, keep pushing and pushing and making people rethink entire frameworks. I am glad that XR's there trying to be engaging in online direct action. I am glad that the unions are trying to do what they do. I'm glad that the churches are trying to build these coalitions. I'm glad that the, that the NGO sector is, is trying to give voice to people as well. I'm so glad there is no one Entity that has the solutions. That's a fact. Mm. But what we do, what we do need to do is um, to be aware that change comes from across the board um, and takes many different forms. And 
that's that's what I just think we'll get there in the end. I have to. I, I just believe that. I do. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing otherwise. I, I'm white. I could have an easy life, you know. <laughs> but you, that you could. You could just. But you don't. You just keep at it. Anyway, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> not going to discourage me from trying to achieve, trying to achieve change. No, in no way am I trying to discourage anyone from that. I think that it's good that we've touched on on, on this point of hope because absolutely we need to make sure that people feel like there is something to do and they can find their place in the many broad yeah. range of activities that are available. Um, everyone that Alison mentioned about building alliances with, and you know, I say this as an atheist, especially including you know, people in religious sectors, is important. We do need to be finding ways that everyone can be getting engaged. But this point of this blind optimism that things will just change, and I'm not saying anyone here has blind optimism, but no, that's what, no, I'm, not, I'm specifically not saying anyone here has that, but that is the thing that we do need to be challenging because it won't just happen just, yeah, just by letting things keep going the way they are. Um, I want to pull on what Mace asked about the local organizing and what XR does. And I have reviewed the business model behind XR's uh, uh, flat, flat way of organizing. It's actually a methodology that one of the founders sells to companies as a way to introduce more democracy into their, into their organizations. But um, this, this idea of circles of these different groups of organizing actually hides hierarchy, and I think that is one of my criticisms of XR and this um, apolitical sort of non-historical perspective of making change. Uh, I see a lot of silo building, I see a lot of places within XR where people can put whatever creative or intellectual energy they have into a specific project that, and, and I mean, uh, Caleb has said the word many times, but produces a lot of good branding for the exercise. It's almost like the marketing crew are all in XR, and it's like, then you've got the rest of us who aren't marketing, and they're like, it'd be great to have more marketing on our other efforts. So, yeah, there is, there is stuff to know in there about building local communities, but that comes, that has to involve bottom-up power. You know, decision-making in XR is actually very restrictive. There's very few people in the XR elite in the UK who make the real decisions about what XR's mission is. Who are the people that are allowed to say, we are apolitical, we don't challenge the police, we don't challenge the politicians, we just want the politicians to change their way. <coughs> that, that's not going to be the case. It has to be that people have the power in their communities to change their communities. And that's where local organising comes into play, not groups where we get to mourn the issues that we have but don't actually get to have any say on how that power gets executed. Can I just quickly reserve one thing and respond to that? Just, um, you touched on something that was really important. You talked about the danger of blind optimism and um, I really want to stress how it, what, an important, what an important point that really was because I agree with you because I see two lots of blind optimism which are very dangerous. The one is that I speak to people, you know, the general public um, having blindly optimistic that when things just get catastrophic enough, it's okay because governments will change the way they operate then. It's why? Straight out why. <laughs> the second blind op the second the second dangerous um, blind um, optimism that I hear is that top technology will save us. It's okay. Technology is a neutral. One hundred percent. It's owned. Um, and it's it's owned and it also doesn't exist yet anyway. So this idea that it's okay, once we get to catastrophic climate change, technology will be able to magically turn the planet around and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think I, I just wanted to make that point because I think I think that's it's that is also the counterbalance to despair and hopelessness is blind, is I think blind optimism is a very real threat and that people hold on to that and unfortunately one of the things we <coughs> do is dispel it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, there's, there's been a lot of critique of XR and I, I pretty much agree with all of it, like the point about intersectionality, the point about um, sort of the problem in the UK where there's there officially aren't leaders but there ends up being sort of a few key players who everyone sort of circles around and listens to. Um, and, then, and then there's also been a lot of talk, okay, we're just going to get out there and give the people these ideas and try and convince them that there's a way forward and ask that how are you actually going to engage with people in the community. Um, socialists have been trying to do that 
for years and years and years through local elections, through rallies, through whatever else, whatever method. It's not like caught on. I don't think that there's, I, th I think the most effective way of getting into the community is utilizing organizations or structures um, like XR local groups to actually be sharing. Because people, people in XR, they're not, they're not a fan of capitalism. Like they're very much like, this system is screwed up, but they're not exactly sure of where to go from there. And I think there's a really great opportunity for people in SA or whatever sort of um, party you're in to get involved and to be sharing these ideas as highly receptive. Like I found myself talking to people who have never been involved in activism, activism before, realizing climate change is bad, and then I say, yeah, we need to start democratizing the economy. We need to start um, bringing democracy back to the community. We need to be not having corporations that can lobby. We need to not have a, uh, a government that is sort of telling us how to live our lives. And everyone's like super receptive to that. Um, I think that we, we need to be utilizing the structures that exist because I don't think SA is gonna create, or any other social org is gonna create those structures. I think that as socialists, we need to be getting into where people are organizing themselves and trying to push it forward and not go, and not sort of lecturing like we need to be just trying to community organize because we've not done that. It's not what mm -hmm. I think I get to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I disagree with Caleb. Uh, I think to say that social has been trying for years ignores the centuries. Um, that nothing has come out of it ignores the Vietnamese who fought as communists against capitalism. It ignores the people of Rojava who fight as communists against capitalists. It ignores the people of Venezuela, the people of Australia, the people of the US, the people of it. Socialists have been actively fighting against capitalism because that's what socialists are. <laughs> that socialists should, and I, so I agree with exactly what Alison said. Yeah, it's great that there is XR, but I see XR as the front of the funnel for other actions. Great. It's a really good way for getting people who are not politically engaged to, under, to, to, to start doing something. But it has such a cap as to what you can do within XR that I don't think it's very useful for socialists to go into there. I think we have socialists in XR and it's great that they're involved in it, but would we as Socialist Alliance put all of our effort into XR? No. XR is one of many movements and specifically set up its ideology to be anti-socialist, to be anti-critical of capitalism, and to not allow those discussions to happen. As Caleb said, you can join, but just don't be too <coughs> socialist about it, because then they'll think you're trying to turn this into socialist movement. I agree, don't try to turn XR into socialist movement. Leave XR as what it is, it's a rebellion, great. Continue to build other alliances and other actions, and absolutely, socialists, see those. Get in there, talk to people, grow their ideology and their mind and understanding of these critiques of capitalism and the downstream effects that are long-held critiques that hold very strong basis in philosophy, in economics, in, in understanding why it is that we got to this inevitable point in our society. This isn't a mistake, this isn't an accident, this isn't a conflict. This happened, we knew this was coming through our critique and through our understanding of capitalism. Okay, we've got Sam. <laughs> Sam JP, we've got one other there. Sam, make sure that mic is turned on. Yeah. Okay, I hope it's on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for some really interesting discussion today. It's been, it's been really great. Um, I think I think there's um, there's no question that we that there is a growing awareness of the, the scale and magnitude of the climate crisis, and that we can't accept any compromise yeah. and, and excuses from politicians. Um, and also a growing awareness that capitalism is incapable of pulling us back from the brink, and that's that's taking various manifestations. And we need to understand that we're still in the early stages of that, um, but that history could really speak up. And pe people's understanding of what capitalism is, why capitalism can't solve the crisis, and we, why we need to get rid of capitalism, that that is going to that is going to gather pace. Um, so I don't think we should get, um, you know, I don't think we should get too hung up on trying to define right now exactly what XR is or isn't, or what school strike for climate is or isn't, or 
it, because these things are evolving, you know, um, they're evolving, they're changing, that th this movement's going to grow in fits and starts, there'll be some missteps and mistakes along the way, that's what, that, the, the important thing for, I think, for, for socialists is, is not, to, not to be on the sidelines just delivering the lectures, but going along the journey with people, you know, and as long as any group whether it's XGAR, school strike for climate, lock the gate, whatever it is, as long as it's um, drawing people into action, moving people forward, and learning the lessons as it goes, you know, and people have people predominantly have to learn those lessons in practice, um, then it's a good thing. Now, it, I mean, if if a bit of it dives down a completely useless, you know, you know rabbit hole like Roger Hallam's proposing to do, <laughs> well, okay, you know, see you later kind of thing. But you know, my assessment of you know, say. In, in Western Australia, anyway, the two sort of most explicit ex expressions of this growing sort of consciousness are in recent times on the street of these schools, Strike for Climate and XR, they're both, you know, you can spend all day talking about their faults, but <laughs> that's, that misses the point, you know, is they're moving tens of, thousands of, tens of thousands of people into action, and so that, how do we relate to that, engage with that, be part of it, that kind of thing. I also want to just pick up on this sort of question about sort of hope and optimism and all that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, if, if any of us thought that there was you know, it's too late, we go to hell in a handbasket, we're all fucked, um, civilization's gonna end, end a story, we'd be at the beach today, it's 35 degrees in Perth, yeah. you know, today. So, you know, so why are we here underneath the fluorescent lights in a, you know, in a, in a meeting, right? So, uh, and I think, I mean, we know that a degree of warming is already built in. Um, and that is already the amount of warming that is built in is gonna pose some really serious threats both to both to the ecosystem and to human civilization, but what we also know is that the society that will is, that is both best placed to turn to change direction, but also is best placed to confront the challenges, is, is going to be one based on human solidarity. Um, but we know what the response of the capitalists and their politicians is going to be. Some people, some, some you hear some people say, "Oh, you know, Morrison and Trump, they've got no plan for climate change, all this stuff." No, they have got a fucking plan. It's called fascism and war. They know what's coming. You know, um, but the point is, you know, all their responses will make everything worse. You know, all their responses to climate change will be to make things worse. So that's, you know, I think that's why we're here. You know, that it, it's not too late to have a better response. You know, well, that's that's my belief anyway. Just sorry to go on. Just another point I was going to make was, um, I think that um, what a real challenge for us is to think about how we can, how can we, how we can bring. Grow it in an organic way, not in a sort of electric, boring way, but sort of anti-capitalist consciousness to this to, to, to this growing movement. You know, I think we just, in Australia we still do need to defeat the idea that somehow green capitalism is possible, um, when it's clearly not. Look, in the abstract, you could imagine a capitalism without fossil fuel use, but there's two problems with that. That wouldn't solve all the other problems of capitalism and how it's pushing up against the um, the boundaries of planet Earth because it's based on limitless growth. But secondly. We have real live capitalists in Australia who make their money from fossil fuels and want to keep it that way, and they hold on to political power, and they will literally fight tooth and nail to keep it that way. So it's, we're not just talking about an abstract capitalism; we're talking about the real capitalists who actually run Western Australia in particular. You know, so we there's, there's no way there's no way of, sort of dodging the fact that we need to break the back of their economic and political power. And I think so. One of the things we've we've been doing in Socialist Alliance is we've just launched a thing called the Eco Socialist Manifesto, and that's. You know, it's not a finished document, it's just our sort of initial sort of draft of trying to engage with ideas, how we can start to popularise in Australia ideas about um, expanding the public sector, democratic public ownership, workers owning, you know, workers including workers in the fossil fuel industry owning the transition. But you can only do that if you start to sketch out a sort of a socialist vision of, of transition. And the final thing I'll say is that, you know, revolutions happen, revolutionary ruptures, such as the one we need to happen with, hap happen with capitalism, will not happen because the majority of people get convinced to be revolutionaries in an abstract sense, but revolutionary ruptures happen when, when it's posed as a practical necessity for ordinary people. Um, and that's, that, that, so that's, that's what is going to have to happen. We're still a long way from that in one sense, but climate change could really accelerate history, you know, and people's, people's how quickly people learn lessons. So we shouldn't underestimate how quickly people learn lessons either, I don't think. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Um, sorry, I definitely... Oh. I'm Aidan. Hi, Aidan. Um, yeah, just to clarify one of the XR people as well, sort of on the periphery. 
due to being unable to incorporate all these criticisms. Um, I, I just want to uh, jump off on the, the hope thing. Because one thing I've kind of noticed is we, we get caught sort of halfway between like Green's eco-socialist utopia or Mad Max capitalist barbarism. But I think we know in the room that we're going to end up with some kind of hybrid thing, you know, and depending on where you are in the world and who you are in that. And for me, part of having a positive vision is it has to feel viable. So I actually find the, the hyper-optimistic visions, you know, big green high-rises, nobody's working, everything's powered by benevolent AI, blah, 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 are very off-putting. So I guess my question for the panel, for anyone who's um, got an idea to share, is like, what is your kind of hybridized, optimistic slash hopeful vision? What does it actually look like? Um, I don't know, risk making a prediction or something like that. What feels viable? Yep, yeah, Um, I can only really speak to Perth because I think the conditions all around the world are vastly different, even over east, um, where it's very different. So here in Perth, I think that. Climate change is going to get worse and worse. Like we're not, we're not anywhere close. Like if we have a revolution, right? We seize power or whatever sort of system we have to take power. The, that transition to change the economy to fix the climate is going to take years. Um, like you're looking at a scale of World War Two mobilization. So I think we're pretty much locked in to some kind of breakdown. I think that through that breakdown uh, is going to come a breakdown in the economy. Um, agriculture potentially is a big one, maybe not in Perth as much because we're a bit of a breadbasket, but maybe in broader Australia we're going to see breakdowns in uh, food security. That's going to require people to start becoming more independent of the communities. So I think we're probably going to see um, communities becoming more independent, becoming more self-sufficient growing out of that. Um, we're probably going to see sort of the dominant economy now um, become sort of challenged by this grassroots economy and I think that grassroots economy's potential to come out of you know, exile local groups or whatever other org sort of more explicitly anti-capitalist sort of community thing that arises. Um, I think that that's probably where we're heading because I don't think we're going to just be able to shut, shut the system down and change it. I think it's going to be messy. Um, do, do you maybe want to add this to Aiden? Because so Socialist Alliance does actually have a, a, a plan, a set plan of policy. Um, yeah, and I haven't had any chance to really touch on, well, I haven't touched on that yet, and so uh, also to bring in what Sam said. So yeah, I, I think it's very important that we, we don't focus on utopian uh, potentialities, you know, thousands of years down the line, and we do focus on what needs to happen now, and what we need to do to transition. Uh, that's why Green, uh, Socialist Alliance has a 13-point action plan, which points out areas where people can be involved in that change. So. Our first point in regards to uh, Aboriginal uh, people having sovereignty over the land and more involvement in decision making about what it is we do. So I think we can all imagine that corporations shouldn't have the right to just go and destroy areas of land without people's involvement and in what's being done there or what's being done with those land. Uh, we use capital a lot to force people to have to make decisions that align with fossil fuel industries as opposed to different ways of people having power over that. Uh, we need to be setting immediate emission targets of reducing our emissions. Um, obviously we need to be getting to 100, but we need to find ways that we can knock out and start lowering that to those targets and showing people that that's possible. Um, I think a point that Sam brought up, and a point that's really uh, doable and starts to cut out a lot of the problems that we have in this fossil fuel heartland, is bringing the power industries under public ownership. We need to take them away from being under capitalist control, under the control of a few people, and put them in the powers of us. We then need to be assessing these corporations not based on their profits, but on what it is the goals are to get out of our power production. <laughs> Banning fracking is just an absolute thing that I'm sure that ever, we are onto our, you know, I don't know how many fracking, anti-fracking campaigns we've had, but we're now at the point where the community is fully aware of what fracking is and is now just like, what do you mean we're doing this still? So this McGowan government with their 98% not fracking and then 2% fracking in the areas that are frackable is just a completely unreasonable and disgusting policy that you can clearly see that it, just bad fracking is an absolute thing that everyone here could imagine us doing and wouldn't have a negative impact on people. It wouldn't have a negative impact on industry. Uh, it would all be good to just ban fracking. Um, redirecting our heavy industry away from 
production of goods that we don't need to productions that we do need. So we don't have a manufacturing industry in Australia really anymore. Uh, so right there is not only jobs for people, but also producing the things that we do need, be that new infrastructure, rail infrastructure, things that move us away from fossil fuels and away from private travel. Um, so I'm not going to go through the 13 points and just read them out to you. I really do think that people should have an opportunity to look at the Social Alliance Action Plan. But our point here is that we are putting forward our plan, which is the second edition of our plan, because as we all know, we've been fighting this for a long, a long time, and we're going to keep fighting it. And to say that it's not, it's not done, because the way that it gets done is through making actual change. And if we can get this into people's minds and get them seeing that there are additional policy points that we could be adding on to the things that we already know, then we could be making change this year, next year, and into the next few years, and into the future, really. Um, so I'm not going to give you our election policies or anything like that. That's all comprehensive. You can get that. And the, what the Greens stand for, the various platforms is all canvassed. Um, but I think that what you've actually touched on it is really important. It actually goes back to a point that I made um, at, the, at the very beginning. And this is about actually talking to people outside of the role that you wouldn't normally talk to. Um, and Firstly, I'll say I think there's always merit in terms of being putting up what you term that sort of green utopian vision because I think it's important that we do and enable people to revision what, uh, what what a future could look like. We don't have to always put everything up uh, within, the, within the framework of, of existing paradigms. It's, I think it's important to be able to let people explore what, a different, what, what different um, ideas would look like. But what I think is really important about what you've touched on is that the reality is the majority of people like the status quo. The, one of the reasons we've got the system that we have is because that's what most people want. What they don't want is for that to be disrupted by climate change. What they don't want is um, for, you know, for, for, for some sort of catastrophic future. They don't because they want things to stay pretty much as they are. Now, we, I work with the people that, that fall through the cracks, um, whether it be the people that are, that are always um, left, left without and who are always struggling, whether it be people who have got um, mental health issues, um, whether it, like all, all of So it, there's a whole range of people within the community that are permanently disenfranchised, outright harmed um, by, by the current systems of power. But for a lot of people, actually it suits them quite fine. They, they've got their house, they're raising their kids, they're going to work, they buy a jet ski, they're doing their thing. Um, and so that is one of the challenges for us because how do you get people to recognise that we do need, that there needs to be some radical transformation when really they don't want that and they're not looking for that. And so how do you, and how do you actually talk to that? But it's a, it's a reality we have to acknowledge that a lot of people are quite happy working under a capitalist system. It's their prefer, it's actually their preferred modus operandi, and they just they prefer it not be disrupted too much. Okay, thanks. All right, I think we take one more point from Graham because we do have a, another panel. We need to take a break for. I just want to comment on what Alison's contribution just then about the sort of general satisfaction of people with the system we live under. Is that what you're saying? I mean, so what about that question of alienation? I mean, as a general problem, I, mean, I heard a socialist lecturer, that he was a socialist, he called himself a Marxist, actually. And in the last course I did with him, he had a section, and he'd more or less given up on the prospect of socialism. And he said, living with alienation. That was part of the course. And he accepted that alienation existed, but the same, to him there's no solution to it. That is a huge problem, isn't it? And this COVID crisis has just reinforced it because we're all separated now. I mean, I'm not saying it, it, it wasn't necessary to deal with the COVID-19 the COVID crisis, but what's happened is we're all been separated into units on a global scale. And it, it's, it, it's, you walk around it. Mean, no, no. I mean, I don't believe that people are happy with that situation. I mean, the alternative is to create a community on a global scale in, in a broad sense. But I know it's a difficult thing to achieve, a uh, hugely difficult thing. But, and I know the Greens want that because it's in their program. I mean, for sure. But, I mean, um, is it 
and, and whether it's actually possible to get it is another issue. But I don't accept, I cannot accept the general assessment of the situation that people are basically happy with what they've got. You know? A lot of people do like the status quo. So, and that ended up, and that, and it unfortunately also contributes to a complacency within the Australian political landscape because people are quite comfortable with it. Can I interject? I, I would read, I think they can both be unhappy and like the status quo. Yes. Like we know there's a massive mental health crisis. Yeah. And, um, people have a you know, very strong sense of ennui and diagnoses of depression and anxiety going up. That doesn't necessarily mean people want to go on a farm and plant crops and no. they don't well, like air con. Well, many people do, many people do, but not a large enough constituency to create change. That's my read anyway. Cartoonies, uh, the newspaper called Direct Action, which is the predecessor of the Green and Left Weekly, it came out until the early 90s, I think. And the, the cartoon occasionally appeared in it saying, Fan the flames of discontent. Now, that might sound a rather drastic sort of slogan, but I mean, it's actually a good idea because if, if there is mass discontent of that, you know, it should be fan. Now, this is a Lenin's idea, that's what Lenin's about. Mm -hmm. if, if, there, if there should be discontent because it, there are a lot, there's so many horrible things going on in, in society on a global scale. And what we should be doing is mounting the movement against that situation and confronting those who are responsible, which is the ruling class, and on a global scale and in every capitalist state. Um, I, I don't know what the Greens think about that, but personally that's, what I, I, that's my idea of what a socialist movement should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, just before we wrap up, take final comments. Are there any people online that have posted any questions? Um, or? Uh, there hasn't been any uh, additional questions, but um, just a comment from Mitchell uh, Daly, if you uh, sure he commented on the in the group chat. It's uh, it, it's debate. Or, I'm sorry. I'll start. Capitalist realism mm -hmm. has given the pervasive impression that there is no viable alternative to capitalism. It's debatable. If it's the only thing they, they, they know, they're going to say they prefer something that they have no experience with. It's ideology at work. Um, yeah. So that was a very relevant comment. Yeah. I wanted to finish my point with the quote from Mark Fisher, who wrote Capitalist Realism, that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, which is why we do need utopian visions bouncing around. We do need creative media educational ways of inspiring people to think about what the future could be. Okay, we might not see that future. I think one of the things you learn as a socialist is that I won't be seeing the world that I want, but am I part of the historical change towards that? Yes. Does that give me purpose? Absolutely. Um, I know for future. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, the fanning the flames discontent, I think that it's kind of a double-edged sword here because Perth is beautiful and great and everything's pretty chill out here for most people. The rest of the world, not so great and chill. And do we want to be introducing hardships into people's lives directly? I think that we need to be supporting the people who do fall through the cracks, which is actually a lot of people in this society. Huge number of people. Huge number of people. Um, and producing those support systems that then give people an opportunity to take a break from the system which is just driving them to a misery that they don't understand, an alienation that they don't comprehend. Because they don't see it as alienation, they just see it as life. And that they're, the way to get out of that is to go to a football game, is to go shopping, is to do the things that make yourself feel good. And it just sounds like the socialists are trying to take away all those nice things. Because that's <laughs> what they've been taught. They want to take away your shopping, they want to take away your sports, they want to take everything good away from you and give it all to the government. And that's a complete misunderstanding of what it is the socialists are advocating for, which is that the wealth has been stolen from the people. It is hoarded by a few dragons in their caves, completely separated from what it is to live in this society, even as someone in a relatively well-off place. These elites live completely different lives. Their problems aren't our problems. Climate change to them, it's all priced in. They'll just move to their place in New Zealand and you know they'll have their guards looking after their warehouses of food. We have the problems ahead of us. We need to be working on the solutions towards them. Thank you, Dave. Any final comments before we wrap? I think I just want people to try and consider the context of Perth and try and think about like 
okay, we all want to get these ideas out there. What's realistically the most effective way to get those ideas out there? And how, and how, do you, how locked in do you really think um, ideas within XR are? Like, I just think people have got to consider that because I think there's a lot of opportunity for change. If you're really thinking that all of society can change, then why can't some of the most radical elements of the activists here in Perth can change? Mm -hmm. Like, I think I think that's like a big, huge load of potential right there. I think I think that should be considered more um, uh, strongly. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap it up there because as I said, we're um, going to take a quick break. We've got some um, wraps. For $5 each, if anyone wants to have a bit of a feed, beers, soft drinks, tea, coffee. Um, thank you, three of you, very, very much. I know we could go on for a, a lot longer, and <laughs> you're going to hate me saying this, but yeah, grab the ear over a wrap if you uh, still want to continue the conversation. She was going a little bit. Can I pass it to the horse? Today, today's actually the day I usually spend with my children. Oh, so I do want to see my kids because I haven't seen them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, thank you very much. For, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for the questions, stimulating discussion. Beauty. And, uh, yeah, just moments like this give me that hope that we talk for. Keep <laughs> struggling forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs>